recording and I'm going to mute everyone. Uh, so Jim, please unmute and uh, uh, welcome everyone. And we're ready. I'm going to spotlight you and we're ready to begin. It's always weird to get yourself spotlighted. <laughs> well, good afternoon uh, to all of you and, and thanks for, for being here. Um, so I guess today's topic is resistance and, and that should be that should be easy that should be a real feel good topic and and you know i mean what could be better than heroism and and you know people doing heroic deeds in the face of evil and so on and and in a lot of ways it is a feel good topic uh but it's not that simple and and i guess that's one of my goals today is to kind of muddy up the issue at least uh to a degree uh in the first place the very term resistance is not that simple to define. It, it's not always clear exactly what is or is not resistance. Uh, the other piece of this is that it's not very easy to assess what was accomplished by it, you know, if anything, when, when all is said and done. So it, it, it's maybe not quite as clean as we like to think, but, but the one really unambiguous message that I would hope will come out of today, if nothing else, um, Jews are often accused of going like sheep to the slaughter. And that's just not true. <laughs> uh, you know, unequivocally, let me let me start there. Um, and, and so I would hope at least, you know, when I'm done mudding the waters, at least that piece of it will not be muddied at all. Uh, so my goal today would be to talk uh, for a few minutes about non-Jews and resistance and then to try to put a little bit more of the focus on Jewish resistance. Uh, so starting, I guess, with, with, with the non-Jews. And, and it's, you know, obviously there was resistance by non-Jews. And it's even one of the reasons I try to be extremely careful in the language that I use and have been using over the past couple of weeks and continue to use and try, for example, to talk about what the Nazis did, not what the Germans did because it's not a fair statement to say that all the Germans did that, you know, and, and, and certainly the, the German people as a whole have some issues that need to be accounted for, uh, perhaps, but, but it, it recognized certainly there was resistance among non-Jews. There was an act of underground and armed resistance, not only in Germany, but particularly in the occupied uh, territories. Uh, and that's over and above the people that rescued, which is next week's topic. <laughs> well, so I'm not even worrying about rescuers today. That's a whole separate issue. Um, but, but that's kind of where we start. And I guess the other place then maybe where we start, and we want to make sure we do it this way, is you. Um, is, is, there it goes with this idea of, of resistance. And, and clearly one of the pieces that I guess we got to remember is that resistance was dangerous, uh, even if you weren't Jewish. Obviously for Jews it was dangerous, but, uh, you know, but even for non-Jews, there's a danger. There's a misperception though that goes with that because I think a lot of people kind of have this image of anybody who resisted the Nazis uh, was was in for let's charitably call it serious treatment, uh, and it it and it, it was not necessarily fatal. It depended a little bit on who you were, what you did, why. Uh, it, it's you know it wasn't um, it was dangerous, but there's a limit to the danger. And and my case in point on that might be somebody like this guy, General Johannes Blaskowitz, who was a uh, commander in 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 the German military. Uh, in 1940, he was the commander of one of the military regions within Poland. Uh, and in 1940, he sent a long memo to Adolf Hitler detailing uh, the atrocities that were taking place against civilians, against Jews in particular, and, and went on to say, not only here's what's happening, but it's wrong, it's counterproductive, it needs to stop. And Hitler got the memo, uh, read it, and dismissed the whole thing as childish and naive. And his comment was, and I'll, I'll quote him, but he said, you can't, quote, win a war with Salvation Army tactics, end quote. 
Uh, but Blaskovitz, he lost his position. He was transferred, so he no longer was in charge of the territory in Poland. Uh, it certainly was not a good career move, but that was his only punishment. He, he was kind of marginalized as not being really reliable, but he was not... Um, he wasn't imprisoned. He wasn't beaten. He certainly wasn't killed. You know, uh, he got, I guess you could say, got away with that. And indeed, you know, you could get away with a certain amount. You could certainly refuse to engage in killing and things like that, under, at least under many circumstances. Uh, the Einsatz group is probably one of the, the really the most horrific groups. The Just to clarify, the Einsatz group was four units uh, run by the SS, although they, they pulled people from, from several different groups and disciplines within the military and, and Gestapo and so on, there were about between 500 and 1,000 people per unit. And these were the mobile killing squads that were sent to the east when the war, ex as it expanded into Poland and then beyond into the Soviet Union and so on. And their job basically was to go into the villages and round up all the Jews and march them to the edge of town where uh, it depends on the, the topography, if there were ravines or they would dig ditches or whatever, and force uh, the Jews basically to remove all their clothing, hand over all their possessions, line them up at the edge of the, the, the ditch and just mowed them down and shot them. Um, mobile killing squads, they killed about a million and a half people in the East. Uh, with this, there, there's, you know, there was all kinds of issues with with what took place there. That's its own story, I suppose. But but my point is that there were members of the, of the Einsatzgruppen who refused to kill. They would not be part of that operation, and they were certainly put under intense pressure, not only from their superiors but peer pressure because. Most of the people that were there were okay with it. I mean, ultimately, <laughs> you sort of had to be, or else if you refused to participate, eventually you would be transferred. Uh, there is no record of members of the Einsatzgruppen or people like that, uh, those kinds of positions, being given, in essence, an order of kill or be killed. Uh, you know, and I'm sure somewhere there must have been one of those. I, I'm not trying to say it couldn't happen, but this was not the policy to say, if you won't do the murdering, you will be murdered. That's not the way it worked. So that kind of resistance was, I guess, in a manner of speaking, allowed. There were also some who spoke out with rather mixed results, I suppose. Uh, this is Bishop Clemens von Galen uh, from Munster in, in Germany, who uh, had spoken out against a lot of the actions of the, the Nazi government. But in particular, in August of 1941, he spoke out protesting the T4 euthanasia, pro euthanasia program. Uh, and, and again, just real quickly, the T4 program, in essence, what they did in this, they started in the institutions where there were uh, people with various handicaps, mental disabilities, physical ones, whatever the case may be, and were in essence institutionalized, certainly considered genetically undesirable. And, and of course, genetics was a big part of the Nazi philosophy. Um, and, and Hitler and others talked about these people as useless eaters. There were posters out, you know, that it costs X dollars a day, well, Reich's marks, but you know, a day to feed and house these people and we're getting nothing back for them. And so the T4 euthanasia program basically was where they experimented with and put in place initially the use of gas chambers to kill them. Um, and the idea of telling them they were taking them to the showers and marching them in and then instead of, of water, it was gas and so on. And thousands upon thousands of people were killed in this T4 program before it was brought to the camps and brought out east for the Jews. Um, Bishop Gott von Galen spoke out in this sermon saying this is a dangerous precedent. If we do this to this group, we can use this against anybody. Then it went on even worse. The sermon was printed. It was widely distributed. It became well known. And Nazi leaders, in many cases, called for discipline and said, this guy has got to be stopped. The head of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, said, you can't do it. He's too prominent. It's too well known. And 
we cannot, it'll only make matters worse if we try to arrest him and discipline him. What's more, just for good measure, three weeks after delivering this sermon, Hitler publicly canceled the T4 program. Uh, he did not entirely eliminate it. It was still done on a reduced scale under a different name. So they still continue to experiment with it and play with it to a degree. But von Galen basically got away with this in terms of challenging them and stopping something. So it did happen. The, the last one I'll mention is kind of an example because this one is less individual and more of a group movement. Uh, took place in, in 1943 in, in Berlin in, on February 27th of 1943. Uh, the, the Nazis rounded up uh, somewhere about six to 10,000 men in Berlin and took them to SS headquarters, which was on Rosenstrasse Street, hence the title of the Rosenstrasse uh, protest. Included in that group of men was about 1,700 to 2,000 Jewish men who had been married uh, to Gentile women. And so were relatively speaking safe in the sense that they might've been stripped of their job. They might have had uh, curfews and restrictions put on their uh, public actions, but they were allowed to stay home, safe, live with the family. They were pretty well protected. Um, and, and so these people were being held at the headquarters on Rosenstrasse Street. The women marched on the headquarters, demanding in first information on their husbands, where they were, what was going on, and to protest their treatment. They brought food. They demanded their release. The SS, and actually you can kind of get an idea when you look at the picture, you know, they were armed protecting the, the headquarters. They fired shots over the crowd's head in an effort to force them to disperse. They refused, the women stayed and continued their protest. And, and finally, it was again Goebbels who decided this was just too much unrest, too much disruption, and with Hitler's approval, released the men on March 6th and sent them home went so far even to track down, there were 25 of the men that had already been sent off to Auschwitz on the trains and had them reloaded on trains and brought back to Berlin and sent home, which is not the only instance of somebody being sent into Auschwitz and getting out in that way, uh, but it's one of the very few, <laughs> that at least that I'm aware of where that happened. Um, unfortunately, you know, usually, uh, resistance was not that successful and not that safe. They didn't get their, their men back or whatever. Uh, case in point, a, a one that became known as the White Rose Movement. The White Rose Movement was a student group headed by uh, Sophie and Hans Scholl, my brother and sister, um, and some of their teachers, the university age, as you can probably guess to a degree by looking at the pictures, uh, and they got involved in, in a movement where they were writing and distributing leaflets, criticizing Hitler, criticizing bystanders and collaborators, naming them, condemning them, and so on. Graffiti on the streets, Hitler, mass killer, you know, things like that. Uh, and they were active in 1942 and 1943. They were eventually caught in 1943. Uh, probably a little bit more the picture that a lot of us have of what happens to resistance. Within four days, they had been executed. So uh, the White Rose Movement ended and, and the treatment certainly is, is rather different, I guess, in that sense. So, you know, that being said, um, let's talk about Jews and, and kind of go in that direction. But, uh, you know, hopefully gives you a little bit better idea of some of the, uh, you know, things that were taking place when I say it wasn't just Jews. The, the issue with Jews, uh, and I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but it's, it's time to go back to that, is that so many people are highly critical of the Jewish people that they went like sheep to the slaughter, as the saying goes, with no resistance, just meekly capitulated. Part of that stems really from a myth that was at least to a degree fostered by uh, Israel and the Israeli government, particularly immediately after the war, when they were trying to promote themselves as 
protection for the Jewish people in the world and tough enough to stand up to the opposition from the Arab world and so on. And how do you make yourself look tough and protective? Well, one of the ways you do that is, you know, say, well, the European Jews were weak and, and went like sheep to the slaughter. So, you know, that's a piece of where that comes from. Uh, realistically, you know, certainly some did go like sheep to the slaughter. I mean, you know, there, there's certainly a, a number of them that just did what they were told and, and accepted their fate. Um, so maybe before we talk about the ones who didn't accept it quite that smooth, smoothly, we should think for a minute about why it would be that people would just accept that fate. Uh, and, and clearly there's, you know, that's complicated. Each case is going to be a little different. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things at play there, but, but certainly, it, particularly in the 1930s, many of the Jewish community believed the lies that were being told about what the intent was of the Nazi party, what was happening to people when they were rounded up and where they were going and so on. Um, it, it didn't take long to, to, to give the lie to some of that, but, but certainly many believed it. Uh, and in many cases, didn't think that the German people or for that matter, other nations of the world would allow the mass destruction of the Jewish people uh, and kind of had the attitude, you know, you know, Jews have always been the victim. We've survived in the past. We'll survive this one too. And, and one of the best, you know, <laughs> summaries of that kind of an attitude uh, was written up in a book by Samantha Powers, which might be a name that, that, that some of you recognize. She's a very prominent uh, historian and political scientist. Uh, she was the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations for a while. She's been active in multiple administrations. As a matter of fact, I think she was just appointed to, to something in the Biden administration. I've forgotten what title, but, but she's fairly prominent and well-known. And she wrote a book called A Problem from Hell, which uh, is about American response to a whole series of genocides, the Holocaust only being one. It is very heavy very thick, and I'd highly recommend it if you got a lot of time because it's really a, an incredible book in terms of what it talks about uh, in, in Rwanda and Bosnia and Cambodia and you know lots of places. It isn't just about the Holocaust. But in that book, she talks about a discussion that took place between uh, a, a Jewish baker and uh, a guy by the name of Raphael Lemkin, who I mentioned, I think, the first I might have mentioned him, I think, the first session. Lemkin is the guy who actually coined the term genocide and was very active in getting the term defined. And, and so uh, he became uh, a, a kind of an interesting case study all his own. But um, Lemkin had this discussion with the baker, and, in, and she quotes this discussion, uh, is saying, there's nothing new in the suffering of Jews, especially in time of war according to the baker. The, the main thing for a Jew is not to get excited and to outlast the enemies. A Jew must wait and pray. The Almighty will help. He always helps. And Lemkin then apparently said, well, haven't you heard about Mein Kampf and what Hitler has said? And the guy said, yeah, you know, he, he had heard of it. Doesn't necessarily believe that Hitler was serious and would follow through on that. And then goes on to say, and how can Hitler destroy the Jews if he must trade with them? I grant you some Jews will suffer under Hitler, but that's the lot of the Jews to suffer and to wait. And, and goes on then to say, you know, in the last war, 1915, 1918, we lived three years under the Germans. It was never good, but somehow we survived. I sold bread to the Germans. We baked for them their flour. We Jews are an eternal people. We cannot be destroyed. We can only suffer. So there's certainly this sense of denial and 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 it's you know that's one example of it but if you think about it it's kind of natural most of us uh you know when we walk down the street and you read about things that go on or or you know diseases or whatever it won't happen to me it you know you might recognize how bad something is but we all have a certain denial that we will be the victim of it and and so there's certainly elements of that furthermore that you recognize that if a jew did respond and resist in some way. They took, a, you know, I mentioned risk, but there's huge risk. Loss of job, loss of home, loss of freedom, physical harm, which certainly was a big part of that, particularly for the Jews, and not just for themselves, but for others as well. 
clearly their family would be taken in and and uh, abused, tortured, whatever you want, you know, as well. Uh, and even part of the community. Part, you know, one of the Nazi policies was the use of massive retaliation. Generally, if one Nazi was killed, 10 Jews were killed in response or more. You know, 100 to 1 was not even an uncommon ratio. So you had to recognize if you resisted, you were endangering a lot of people. And there's this feeling of I'm one person, what can I do? You know, what good is it going to do for me to to try to do something? All I'm going to do is bring trouble down on everybody's head. And then by the time they recognized maybe that this was a lie, that yes, it could happen to me, that, you know, all this other stuff happens, they're in a ghetto or in a camp. And at that point, they're sick and they're weak. They're unarmed. Uh, they're boxed in. Now resistance becomes extremely difficult. So, you know, that's part of the problem was saying, you know, well, the Jews didn't fight back. There's a lot of reasons to not fight back. But resistance, and this goes uh, back to where I started today, it's, it's not just physical. It's not just a question of physically fighting back. For example, the, the, it was illegal, but Jews continued to teach the customs of the Jewish people, uh, even in the ghettos, even in the camps to their children, to, you know, to the rest of the community. Uh, I mean, it was illegal to teach anything, let alone to preserve Jewish custom. And, and they did that. There were all sorts of secret schools in most of the ghettos and most of the settlements. They also would continue to practice their Judaism in, you know, in some cases very quietly, but they wouldn't give it up despite what the, the, the pressure might be. In some cases, it was a little bit more uh, uh, obvious, you know, and observance of Shabbat and things like that. Uh, there's a survivor, a woman by the name of Ruth Brand, who tells the story uh, about being a teenager uh, at Birkenau in, I think it was 1944, if I remember correctly. And it was Yom Kippur. And she was on a work detail with a group of other women. And it was Yom Kippur. She refused to eat. Yom Kippur is a fast day. I'm not going to eat. They said, what do you mean you're not going to eat? We're all starving to death. Of course you're going to eat. No, I'm not going to eat. You know, was, was, was her attitude. And they said, you know, don't you think God wants you to eat given our circumstances? No, I think God wants me to prove that I really believe was kind of the response. Well, the Nazi guards caught wind of this. And now the entire group of them we're doing push-ups and sit-ups and running laps around the yard and, you know, and, and so on and so forth that, you know, all sorts of punishments. And then they basically said, sit down and eat, you know, and, and, and do what you, what you're supposed to. And she still refused to and shamed a couple of the others into continuing with her. And, you know, ultimately she, she took the, as she puts it, what they called soup, and put it in a, you know, in her cup and saved it for later in the day, by which time it had spoiled because it was hot and it wasn't, you know, and so it was, you know, she had to throw it out, uh, you know, but, but that kind of thing is certainly a form of resistance, even if it's not the, uh, you know, the physically fighting back, perhaps, that we sometimes think about. There's also the attempts by many to bury artifacts and, and preserve a record of Judaism and create a record of what was happening to them. The Skokie Museum has pieces from the Warsaw Ghetto that were buried that, that gave testimony to what was happening there and, and what went on. There were Jews writing poems, uh, writing music, right, you know, and, and so on, draw, you know, paintings, all kinds of different things that were done in an effort to preserve a record and preserve the memory. It, uh, it was kind of an interesting comment. Um, I mentioned Estelle Laughlin, I think, last, near, near the end of the session last week. She's a survivor from around here. Um, and and uh, I heard her present about a month ago. And in that presentation, she talked about how her mother uh, would get so angry. And, and Estelle survived the Warsaw Ghetto. That's where she was from, ended up from. Um, her mother would get so angry because people would question her, why didn't you resist? And her answer to them was, do they have any idea how hard we work to remain human? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, and so that's a, just, that's a piece of this. 
And, and there's a, a one brief testimony I, I thought I would share with you today. It's, it's, it's pretty short, but it's uh, from a guy by the name of Roman Kent, um, who talks a little bit about this idea of resistance. And there's Roman. So. Ghetto. There was a creation of, of a certain, call it the communist uh, movement. And some of the leaders in the communist movement, some of them were very good friends of mine that went to school together. Uh, they, they organized, and particularly our resort was excellent to it, that we did what we would call it here in the United States, like slow down strikes. Uh, when the management wanted us to do 10 pieces a day, we would do only two. And, uh, and we realized that the management would be afraid to do anything to us because if they openly would say that, hey, you've got a slowdown strike, they would be punished by the Germans. So in a way, we were playing them against the Germans and we are saving our lives by very low production. So uh, I say this because in many instances, I heard so many times being said that uh, the Jews didn't do anything. Uh, they went like a sheep to the, uh, to the uh, ovens. But it's not true because this was also a resistance. Resistance does not have to be with a gun and a bullet. As a matter of fact, sometimes the easiest resistance is with a gun and a bullet. It, um, I love that statement. And, and it, it maybe is a good chance to kind of take a breath and, and give you a chance to respond. You know, his comment that the easiest resistance is with a gun and a bullet. You know, and I'm curious how some of you you know, what, what does he mean? What do you think of that? How do you respond to that statement? Well, I, I mean, the way I take it is that uh, the, the responses they made to make things more difficult long term was just a smarter response, a more intelligent kind of response, more well thought out that actually might have been made, you know, been more damaging to the Germans than just quick killing a few people and then being killed yourself. Anybody else uh, like I that? Also, I, yeah. I also think that um, when you speak to audience Americans, um, Israelis, Americans who live in the time of Israel, it's just very hard to explain um, you know, that by living, you are resisting. And that, you know, the way we deal with um, anti-Semitism today or our government is not the way Jews, you know, um, related to their government in, in Europe. And they were, you listen, there were pogroms. The Jews didn't have a great time of it, low these many centuries. And they thought, okay, we're going to get, we're, we'll deal, we'll deal, we're going to get out of it, we're going to get out of it. And they didn't get out of it. And so it's frustrating uh, for me because I have brought in many, many speakers. And when people, that's the one question, why didn't they resist? That just pushes every button that I, I can't, I, you know, it's like, you don't know anything. Yeah, I know you're not a fan of that question. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, James, mm -hmm. it's Marilyn. I don't think that we can say a people who died with the Shema on their lips died because they didn't resist. They, I mean, we have often heard the story that so many died saying the Shema. And that moves me so deeply every time I think of that. And I think about the um, leaders in, um, in the ghettos, some of the rabbis who, try to keep up the spirits 
of our people by asking them what they had to look forward to in the future. And when, when all was said and done, we learned so much, Rabbi Sachs says, from Holocaust survivors because there they are, they come and they make a new life. They have lost everything, some of them, and they have families and children and, and create jobs for themselves. And sometimes don't even talk about their experiences as we know for years later, they don't focus on what was, but they focus on the future. And I'm just so proud of being a Jew. Thank Marilyn, thank you. Um, yes, Susan. No, go ahead. That's um, Susan has her hand up and then Rick. Uh, yes. Um, when you were talking about uh, the German men that were married to Jewish women, um, I had a sister-in-law, she's since divorced from my brother, but um, a Dutch Jew whose father was Gentile and her mother was Jewish. And the mother was taken away to a camp and was in the camp for nine months, but because the father was not Jewish, he managed to get her out. And uh, they survived the Holocaust, uh, but this woman was never mentally normal after that. And she raised four children and they've all got weird problems because of being raised by a woman who suffered so at the hands of the Nazis, even though she did survive because her husband wasn't Jewish. A lot of it got passed down. And, and certainly the, if you were Jewish, even if you were even if you married well, you were at risk of serious problems in life. Right. Just thought I'd share that. No, thank you. Uh, it's it's important. Mm -hmm. Rick, you want to well, move yeah. on maybe? I am yeah. struck by the parallel uh, between the words resistance and the word we've used quite a bit in the past year or so, resilience. Mm. And although um, certainly by no means have the challenges been the same, between what the Jews faced in World War II and the Holocaust and what we have faced in the past year or so with COVID. Um, when you are talking about the uh, ability to continue to educate uh, or to uphold Jewish traditions and practices, I'm struck with what we have done, even within our Macomb Soul L Lakeside community, to uphold our ability to educate our congregation and to uphold our traditions and practices. I see some, some parallels and uh, I'm kind of struck by that. Yeah. Uh, rising to the challenges and exercising resilience. Yeah, it's certainly, takes a certain amount of toughness and resilience to we life has got challenges we all have that was the comment from Estelle off and we all face a certain amount of it but the resilience of these people uh to overcome is is critical because if you don't fight back then you do become the victim and uh, it, it really required a conscious effort if there was no if you didn't have the will you you didn't make it 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 is one of the striking things. And, and the result is just about every survivor I've ever met, one of the first words I used to describe them with almost without fail is they're pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. Gotta be, got to be. And of course, there's also the physical resistance. You know, that's the other piece of this. And, and if, you know, again, there's some of it's the misperceptions. We, uh, there's been actually a, a several books recently written as well as some articles that have focused on the role of women in the resistance, including the physical resistance. And, and so, uh, you know, we, we gotta try to remind ourselves because sort of the mental picture focuses on the men fighting back. And it wasn't just men, even if, you know, a good percentage of them obviously were. There was clearly an active guerrilla underground uh, going on during during the war, uh, but you know, for Jews, if you wanted to participate in in the guerrilla underground, that was going to be a real challenge because part of of, of what's required. I mean, guerrilla warfare is 
based uh, on the idea of uh, blending in and being supported by the indigenous community around you. And for the Jews, uh, even the other partisans would not in many cases accept them because they were anti-Semitic. And, and so you couldn't just join the underground if you wanted to, because in many cases they'd turn you out or turn you in. Likewise, even if you were your own group, you might not find it very easy to get support from the locals, shelter, food, clothing, you know, whatever, medical help, whatever the case may be. So these people are, are, are really left on their own to say nothing of how they jeopardize those they left behind if they tried to escape to the underground. Uh, once people realized they were missing, their family was held accountable, their neighbors and all that. Uh, but there still were a, a certain number that did it. Um, one of the, uh, it, well, the best estimate is, is probably about 20 to 30,000 Jews participated in, in underground movements, mostly in the East, uh, mostly there because the forests were thick enough they could live and hide in the forests, which was kind of where they had to go to, to survive. Uh, and, and probably the most famous of, of those uh, is, is this group, the, the Belsky brothers, uh, who it's about 15, 20 years ago, I guess, the movie Defiance was made that tells their story. Uh, of course, as only Hollywood can do it, but, but the Belskys uh, had an active movement that blew up trains, attacked military units and so on. They were in Belarus, which was part of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the three brothers that you see there were in their 30s when the German military invaded their community uh, in 1941, and they fled to the forest that surrounded the village, which they had grown up in the area. They had grown up hunting and playing in the forest. They knew their way around it. They were, they were very at home there. But from the forest, they watched as their parents, their other siblings, and their townspeople were all slaughtered by the, you know, the, the, the Nazis that came in. So they ended up creating a settlement out there in the woods of Belarus where they could live, uh, you know, without being found, where they could, as I say, engage in these various acts of, as they called it, defiance, uh, military actions and so on, and created a settlement that ultimately saved over 1,200 people. One of the larger groups, not the largest, but certainly one of the larger ones that, that we know of. Uh, and what was really remarkable is Tuvia, who was the oldest brother and, and the guy there in the middle, uh, made it his policy that they didn't just bring in a bunch of men, because we're talking about trying to hack out a living in a forest. They brought in women, they brought in children. He basically said, anybody who can get here, we're going to protect them. And, and the hardships, you know, when they were uh, fleeing because a military unit might realize, finally track down where they were, and they would take people through the forest, you know, get carrying women and children across swamps to get away from, from their pursuers and so on. What they did was, was really pretty remarkable and lasted for years at this. Um, Tuvia and his brother Zeus both survived, made it to the United States, and lived here after the war. Uh, their, the brother Assel, uh, when they were liberated by the Soviet military, joined the Soviets and fought alongside them and was killed in, in battle. So he did not ultimately survive the war. The, the, the piece that people are less familiar with, that's, that's the movie, you see all that. There was a fourth brother that survived. Uh, Aaron, who was a young child at the time, he was much, much younger than his brothers, but they had gotten him out with them, and they, they saved Aaron, even though he is totally ignored in the movie. Part of the reason he's ignored in the movie, not only was he young, uh, but he also ended up in the United States and years later was found guilty of perpetrating uh, financial fraud against other Jewish survivors that had come to the United States. So. He's kind of the uh, black sheep of the family. <laughs>
So, you know, that that's that's the Belskis. Most of the Jews, though, were living in the ghettos and living in the camps where resistance was difficult at best, especially if we're talking physical resistance. How do you get arms? Uh, how do you plan? What do you you know, what do you do? And and especially because you're risking everybody's lives. But some did. Um, you know, one of the problems with that, though, is we know so much less about it because you know, there's thousands upon thousands of pictures of the camps and the ghettos and so on. But think about it. Who took the pictures? It was the Nazis, you know, <laughs> that, that could take the pictures. The Jews didn't have cameras, let alone would they be allowed to photograph things and document what was going on and, and, and keep the memory alive, nor would the Nazis, uh, they wouldn't want to picture some of what went on. They didn't want to memorialize the resistance and so on, or even acknowledge it. Uh, so there's very little record of stuff from the Jewish perspective in, in that sense of the word, which is part of what makes this particular picture so remarkable. And it's a little hard to see, but I can't help it. It's the best we got. Um, this made it out of, uh, out of Auschwitz. And it was a drawing that was done by one of the, the Jewish prisoners there. But what's remarkable about it, if you look at it, it's what it shows. I mean, we're talking about people fighting back people fleeing, you know, all kinds of active resistance. And, and what the uh, scholars have, have been able to piece together from looking at this and, and you know, a couple of things that they've got is, is that this resistance was a great deal more common than we normally think of because we have no physical record of most of the resistance. There clearly were revolts, even in the death camps, as, as remarkable as, as some of those were. Uh, for example, 1943, both Treblinka and Sobibor, there were revolts that took place there against the, uh, uh, the Nazi guards and, and, and so on. Uh, but the problem is that most of the people that perpetrated those revolts were hunted down. Very few of them made it very far. Um, and, and of course, most of them never made it out at all because basically what ended up happening is they were all brought back into the camp and everybody was killed. At which point, both of the camps were burnt down, plowed under, trees planted over them to hide them, and that was the end. So I've, I've forgotten the number. I think there's something like 60 people that they think have basically survived Treblinka when all said and done and similar numbers, uh, you know, at, at, at some of these other camps. But we know there were revolts there. Probably the one that is best known as far as those kinds of revolts uh, took place at, at Auschwitz-Birkenau, where the Sunder Commando were involved. And the Sunder Commando were the, the inmates. I, I think of all, the, but one, of all the books I've read about the Holocaust, the, the one about them was one of the most difficult to get through. <laughs> Uh, the Sunder Commando were the, the inmates that were pulled out and forced, in essence, to work the death chambers. They were the ones who forced the people to undress and herded them into the gas chambers. They were the ones who then cleaned up the mess and pulled out the bodies, dug out the gold fillings from their teeth and looked for any remaining valuables and so on, and then threw the bodies into the crematoria. I, I mean, what the Sunder Commando had to go through is just absolutely beyond description. But there was a group of them in Birkenau who managed to smuggle in a certain amount of gunpowder. And the way they managed to get a good um, good percentage of it, I don't know exactly you know, how much was involved with it, but I mean, the uh, women who were on work details would get gunpowder and shove it under their fingernails to bring it into the camp at night when they returned. And then of course, you know, scrape out and save the gunpowder. And they managed to get enough of it when all said and done, that in October of 1944, they blew up one of the gas chambers, destroyed it entirely. Um, you know, but then you get into the, what do you accomplish with that? Since that was one of four in Birkenau, let alone the ones in some of the other parts of Auschwitz. And of course, all of them were caught and executed. And, you know, that's what ended up happening. There's other stories like that, uh, even at places like Auschwitz. There's the story of one woman, for example, who was 
uh, brought in, you know, on the, on the transits. She was shaved down, totally naked and being marched into the gas chamber when she stepped out of line and grabbed the uh, gun from one of the guards and opened fire on them on her way into the death chamber. I, you know, and of course they turned and shot her. She was, you know, she was shot and killed. So again, you get into the, you know, the, the, the piece of, of what you, you get for that, but you know, that kind of resistance occurred. Uh, and, and so the other piece that I'm going to take just a minute or two to, to talk about, and, and then we can kind of explore it from there, I guess, probably the most well-known piece of resistance is the one that took place in the Warsaw Ghetto in, in 1943. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, the first session how hundreds of thousands of, of the Jews were deported, uh, the great deportation in the summer of 1942. In January of 1943, uh, Himmler issued an order to round up another 60,000 Jews from what was left of the Warsaw Ghetto, and the numbers were way down at that point. Uh, and, and ship them off. And this time, unlike during the Great Deportation, some of them fought back, stopping the action. It, it got so difficult that the, the, uh, the, the Gestapo and so on were forced to pull back and, and kind of reset themselves. The lesson to the Jews in the ghetto, don't go so easily. We can resist, we can do something. And, and Part of what motivated them is, is they had come to the conclusion that the Soviets would be there to liberate Warsaw if they could hold out for about six more months. That's what they estimated it was going to take. It was a little bit more, but that's, you know, uh, ultimately their feeling was if we hold out for six months, we can make it. So the Nazis tried after this revolt in January first to bribe Jews to leave to offer deals, we're going to send you to a work camp in the West, which doesn't mean, of course, they honored the <laughs> offer, but they did, you know, it was, they tried to get people to voluntarily leave. But by springtime in April, there were still about 50,000 Jews left in Warsaw. And at that point, they had begun to organize. There was a group of about 750 to 1,000 uh, Jews living in the ghetto. They organized themselves into a group that was called the ZOB. I don't know the Polish translation for those letters, but the English translation is Jewish Combat Organization. Uh, it was under the, I guess I'd call it the quasi leadership of this guy. He was a 23 year old guy by the name of, of Mordecai Anelowish, who um, I say quasi leadership because there really wasn't a, a specific leader of this group. Uh, there was a group of them that 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 kind of had a, a role, but he was the most public face of it, and and uh, he was helping to train and organize the people. There was a second group called the ZZW, about the same size. They started to hoard supplies and bring some into the ghetto and prepared for what they recognized was going to end up being a fight to the death. It was uh, April 19th, Passover, that the Nazis began action. And if you recall, uh, last week I had made the comment that Yom HaShoah, uh, especially in America, is based off of the beginning of the revolt in the Warsaw Ghetto, and that it's a lunar calendar, so it shifts around, uh, hence April 19th that year, but you know, last week for us. Um, one of the things the Nazis had a real penchant for was to begin major actions on Jewish holidays uh, when they thought maybe their guard would be down and because they liked the irony of it, the, um, the, the massacre of 30 some thousand Jews at Babi Yar was during the High Holy Days in September. Uh, you know, so, so this was not an uncommon timing, but the, the Nazis came into the Warsaw Ghetto at this point on, on April 19th with over 2,000 troops to round up the remaining Jews. And what resulted from that was a, um, you know, the, the, this, this battle that lasted for almost four weeks, which rather um, ironically is longer than the entire duration of Poland at the beginning of World War II. Uh, you know, they, they in September of 39. 
the Nazis were ultimately forced to bring in reinforcements and burn down the ghetto house by house to uproot this uh, revolt. Uh, Anelowish was, was killed for what it's worth on May 8th, so he did not make it to the end, um, but, but he lasted for whatever that would have been, three, three weeks or so. Uh, ultimately, on May 16th, the Great Synagogue was blown up, and that was the end of the ghetto. And so those that were left were rounded up and sent to the death camps. And, and the pictures, there's, there's several pictures taken by Nazis uh, to celebrate their victory, uh, but, but pictures of the roundups of the, the residual people that were left in the Warsaw Ghetto. The, the picture on the top is one of the most famous pictures probably of, of all of this era, because uh, it's so poignant. The, uh, I, I, I just, as an aside, I got an email literally this morning about a new program from the Illinois Holocaust Museum, and that picture is featured in the, in the mailing. It's, so it just, you know, it, it's a particularly well-known picture of it. But they were marched in and, uh, or marched off and sent to the death camps. And, and that became the, uh, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising which I guess kind of uh, leaves us with, you know, a, a question in our mind in the sense that the Germans claimed, and I did use that word that time, <laughs> the German government, uh, claimed this as a great victory. So did the Jews. So who's right? What was accomplished? No takers? Okay, Was anything I'll, accomplished? Maybe I'll, I should have. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> I mean, at least for, not at least, but um, in terms of history, it is something that we teach. And, um, and there's definitely, there's definitely an element of pride and there's an element of, you know, look what we can do. I think there's little question others knew this had taken place. It was talked about in the other ghettos. It certainly was talked about in the camps, particularly when what was left of the Warsaw Ghetto went there. Uh, people in many cases were inspired by it and, and so on. I, I think the interesting piece is that despite the fact that the government claimed this as a victory, Himmler said that, there, that this was a total failure and complained that there was so much destruction and so much effort required to contain it that he considered this a, a, a really bad thing. Well, or perhaps I guess in lieu of, of that specific set of comments. Um, I'll, I'll say I'll something. I, I think that they both, they both could feel they won because nobody won. They both maybe made strides a little bit towards what they were looking for, but in the end, nobody won. Right? They, the Jews caused a problem for the Germans. The Germans were resisted. I mean, there were, it was still. Um, they both felt like they had made some some stride. Maybe there's other comments or questions at this point. That's that's kind of what I've got put together for today as far as resistance. Hey, Jim, it's Steve. I guess both sides could claim victory because they each at least in part achieved some of their objectives. The Germans of rounding up and eventually killing off all the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. And while the Jews had hoped to hold out long enough for, to be rescued by the Russians and they didn't achieve that, but what they did achieve is they tied up the Nazi war machine for a while. They did kill off a bunch of Nazis. They forced the Germans to put far more resources into this effort. And they showed that resistance 
while not achieving all objectives, could achieve at least some of your objectives. All right. Thank you, I'll buy that. Well, in lieu of other questions or comments, I mean, we're two minutes before three, but that's not bad. Um, so I, we can we could call it a day. Uh, next week we'll we'll kind of flip this on its head and look at the uh, at the rescue operations. You know what that looks like. So um, it's good to see everybody um, in the chat. If you want to order Rainbow or Plain Holiday, I have put that there. Um, also, um, you know, classes continue. This Sunday is Dee Herman at 1030, and she's from the Jewish Earth Alliance as we get into um, Arbor Day and Earth Day and, and all of that. So um, I hope that you can uh, join us then, and it's good to see everybody. And um, um, if you need anything, just let me know, and Holly's on, you can let her know too. <laughs> And I thank okay. you all for your, uh, your, your interest and participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Special Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.